I invite you to open a Bible to the Gospel of John chapter 10 as we see Jesus giving another I am statement. As we begin this new year, our goal as a church is to simply know Jesus better, right? Not to do more things, not to put more pressure on ourselves or more um, requirements of these things are the things I got to do to make God happy or to become a better Christian, but to set out at the start of the year with a simple desire of how do I know Jesus better? And so what we are doing is we're studying the I am statements of Jesus found in the Gospel of John where he teaches us not only who he is, but ultimately who our God is. And the reason Jesus chooses to say I am multiple times is because of a story from the book of Exodus where God meets with Moses and Moses asks him what his name is and God says, I am, which just means I exist. I, I am the one who gives life to everything. And so God is revealing himself to Moses saying, I'm the one who exists. I'm the one who gives life to everything. And I'm also the one who has heard the prayers of my people and come to be with them and redeem them and deliver them. And so when Jesus is doing his earthly ministry and people are asking questions about who he is, and there's all kinds of theories, he walks around saying, I am, with the intention of revealing to you and to me and anybody that will listen that he's not just a miracle worker, he's not just a wonderful teacher, he's not just good at ethics, but that he is the God who has come to redeem and deliver and rescue his people. And today he reveals himself, he says, I am the door, which if you are making a list of the seven I am statements, I would assume this is one of the ones that gets left off, right? Because, you know, light of the world, how many of you have heard that one before? You're like, yeah, Jesus is the light of the world, right? I'm the bread of life, communion, we get that. And then you're like, door. Why a door, right? And so that's what we're going to look at today in the Gospel of John, where Jesus comes and he reveals to us that he is the door, and he's trying to teach you and me something about his love for you and me, something about his character of who he is as our Savior. So in verse 7, Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. So Jesus is saying is, I'm the entrance to the pasture that gives life, that all the things that you and I are looking for and needing to fill life, to meet our needs, he's saying, I'm the one that gives you those things. And you're not going to find it anywhere else. And that's a wonderful promise. You're like, oh, wow. Jesus says, I'm the one that gives you access to the pasture that gives you life, right? And he's playing off of the imagery from Psalm 23 where he says, he is the good shepherd who makes us lie down in green pastures, right? He's, He's the God who guides us to the things we need for life. Now, one of my uh, professors, when I was in undergrad, he taught us theology, and I went to a Lutheran university, so we had chapel that was highly recommended to go to, especially when one of your professors was the one leading it, right? So I went, and I remember um, one of my professors was teaching on this, and he goes, see, it's so simple, right? Jesus is the one who offers us access to all the things we need for life, right? Right? Doesn't that make sense from the text? And so what my professor go, said was, well, it's that simple, so go and do it. And then he walked and sat down in the pews. And that was the end of the sermon. And I was like, oh, that's a good idea for today. Um, <laughs> I don't know how you feel about that, but I was like, oh, that was a really good sermon. All right. Now, he made, was making a point of you and I could grasp the idea very easily, Right? This is not a hard picture for us to understand. Jesus is saying, look, I'm the door, I'm the gateway to the pasture that the sheep need to get access to all the things that they need for this life and the next. We go, oh yeah, I get it. That makes so much sense. And the point that my professor was making when he just stopped and sat down after like 30 seconds of preaching, which shocked all of us, was 
even though it makes sense and it's really simple to understand, you and I have a problem, which is we don't actually do it, right? We don't actually listen to Jesus. We don't actually follow his invitation. Instead, what we are doing is in our sinfulness, we knock on all the other doors that life offers to us. That's what Jesus calls thieves and robbers that came to kill and destroy. That's the exact same way Jesus will describe the devil, that he is one who comes to deceive, to kill, and to destroy. And so our issue isn't that we don't have the invitation from Jesus. The issue is that we don't understand what he's saying, right? There's other parts of scripture where Jesus is teaching us, and let's be all be honest for a second. We read it, and it's in red letters, and we go, well, it must be good, but I don't get it, right? Has that ever happened to you? It's happened to me a lot where you're reading Jesus, and you're like, must be good. Jesus said it, but I don't get it, right? This one is not like that. This is a very easy, he's the door. He's the gate that leads me into the pasture that actually gives life, gives me the things that I need for my life and my soul. So what's the problem? The problem isn't understanding, right? The problem is obeying his call in our life Our problem is faithfully trusting him that this is the best gate. This is the best door to go through. That's the best pasture to live in. And one of the impressions my professor left on me was like, that's our issue is so often what we're doing is we're trying to knock down every other door, go to every other pasture and say, this will be where I find life. Another way to put it in the language of Jesus is, we tend to listen to the thieves and the robbers more than we want to admit, right? Because you know, the problem is not understanding, correct? We're all in agreement on that. Like you all said, yeah, I get this passage. Jesus is the door. He leads me to life. Now, here's the other thing about sheep, right? It's a wonderful picture. It looks so tender that Jesus carries us as his sheep, and that's all true. But I've, talked, I've never been a farmer, but I've talked to farmers. You know what they tell me? Sheep are dumb, right? It's not exactly a compliment that God's laying out for you and me of like, you're my sheep, right? He could have picked smarter animals. Dogs are pretty smart, right? right? He could have picked a lot of other things, but like, you're, you're my favorite doggos, but he didn't. He said, you're my sheep, why? I'm gonna be mean real quick. It's because we're dumb, right? Spiritually speaking, we're foolish. We're like, oh, that's the door I should walk through? Cool. I'm going to go check out this one real quick, though. Right? Anybody watch game shows growing up? I watched all these game shows with my grandparents growing up. I don't know if they're on TV anymore or not. But, um, and, like, it was always, like, here's this guaranteed thing. And then what do they do to trick you? Right? And you're always yelling at the TV, don't do it. Right? It's like, they can't hear you guys. Right? <laughs> Right? And it's like, here's this guaranteed good prize reward. And then it's like, here's door number two and three with mysteries behind it. And what does almost every contestant on the show do? Act like a dumb sheep. and like, I wonder what's behind that door. It could be. And it's like nothing. It's a gift card. And you're like, that's it? Right? And what does Jesus say? You're my sheep. I love you. I'm your shepherd. I'm going to lead you to a new life. That's love. That's his tender mercy and grace for you and me, as dumb as we are, as foolish as we are. And yet, what's our issue as human beings? We hear that voice of the shepherd, we go, I just really want to check out door number two. Right? I'm going I'm to check out door number three, just for a moment. Right? Anybody done that? And it's like, like, oh, yeah, God wants me to do that. That's great. But... Now, here's, here's the real way good Christians do this, because I know you're all wonderful, good, mature Christians, is this. Jesus tells us to do something. He calls us to do something as a sheep, and here's the way we do it. We go, oh, it's important. I want to do it. I'll get around to it later. Don't show your hands. <laughs> 
Have we ever been guilty of that where you're trying to like play this middle game of like rather than walking through the door and through the gate and, and following Jesus wherever he leads, going, hey, this might not be my will, but I know it leads to a better life. We go, I'll get to it later. I'll get time for that another day. Right, right now, Tuesday starts with two, so I'm going to go through door two, right? Like, it is, and, and, you know, on Friday, I'll get to what God wants me to do. These are the subtle ways that, that Satan deceives us. Now, Jesus isn't as nice about it, about the reality. He doesn't soften it, right, of like, oh, it was just a mistake and come over here. Here's how he describes it. He says in verse 10, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. We think it was just a bad choice. It just was unwise, right? Like, I just wasn't smart. I was, no, I was acting kind of foolish, but, you know, I'll do better next time, right? We think maybe it's just a bad habit because we want to soften the blow, right? And like, it's, it's just... It was just a different door. Lord, it's okay. I'll come around to yours eventually. And we want to soften the blow, right? So we have all kinds of other descriptions for it. What does Jesus describe it as? A thief who wants to steal you away from him, take you to a different pasture in order to kill and destroy. That sounds like more serious than, you know, I just made a bad choice. Everybody's, everybody's foolish sometimes, right? Now, why would Jesus use such harsh language? I mean, we're his sheep. Doesn't he love us? Right? Yeah. He uses harsh language so you and I will be honest about it. We'll actually turn to him and realize there is no other life anywhere else. He's the only one offering it, right? He says the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. And so he's trying to wake you and I up spiritually to realize he's the only one offering actual life. He's the only one leading you and I to a pasture that will sustain us in this life and for all eternity. All the other doors, all the other gates that we want to knock on and knock over and barge through, you say, that's the thief, that's Satan deceiving you and I into believing lies and thinking, I can get a little bit of the life that I want over here. But ultimately, Jesus is saying, yeah, but that's not going to lead to life. Now, here's how this works, and you know it's true. There is God's will, there's God's desire, there's God's invitation through Jesus to say, come follow me and I will lead you to life. I'm the door, I'm the gate. And yet, what do we do as humans is, in our arrogance, maybe, in our pride, in our foolishness, however you want to label it to make yourself feel better, we think we know better, right? Now, from a young age, we learn to declare <laughs> with our words and our actions what? I know better than everybody else, right? And all the parents in the room are like, amen, right? <laughs> like, how many times as kids do we do foolish things even though a parent or a grandparent, someone that loved us was telling us there's a better way, <laughs> there's a simpler way, there's a, there's a way that's going to make you happier. And we go, don't tell me what to do. I know what I'm doing. Right? I'm going to do it myself, right? Famous words of every toddler. I can do it. Who's heard those words before? And just lost your mind. You're like, that's it. I love this kid. He's my sheep, but my goodness. All right? How many of us have declared those words, though? Now, here's the thing. It's kind of like, oh, let's laugh about it when it's toddlers. Here's a dirty little secret we don't want to admit as adults. We rarely ever grow out of that mindset. I can do it myself. I know better. Nobody can tell me what to do. 
How many of you as adults, not just as kids, as adults, raise your hand, show, you like having other people tell you what to do with your time and your schedule? Right, yeah, it's not a lot of volunteers for that one. Right? It's just like, no. Why? Because I know better. I can do it myself. I've got better plans, dreams, ideas, whatever, right? Jesus says, I am the door. He didn't say, I am a door. He said, one of many doors. I am the door, the gate that will lead you to life. And our response, oftentimes in our sinfulness, is no one can tell me what to do. I'm gonna go my own way. I'm gonna build my own door and then walk through it. I'll show you, right? Because we don't wanna be told what to do. Here's the problem that we've all learned from our own life lessons. And when you're a little kid, you're like, I can do it myself. Don't tell me what to do, I'm gonna do it my way. How many of you ever finally realized that didn't always end well for you? Anybody get that gift of wisdom eventually? Like, I didn't. Right? And then, like, the words that every mother, I know this because my mom's told me, <laughs> has ever wanted to hear from their kids, Mom, you are right. <laughs> it's way better than I love you. Right? <laughs> it's like, Mom, you are, even if it comes decades later, they're so happy to hear that. Right? So it takes a while. But eventually, sometimes we are given that gift of wisdom, whether it's from God or from hard experience. We all know in life that sometimes I'm wrong. Sometimes I couldn't do it myself. Sometimes I wasn't right. Sometimes, this would be really hard for some of us to accept, my plans aren't actually that good or as awesome as I thought they were going to be. And here's a harder way that we know this from the sorrows of this life. Sometimes that hope and that dream, that thing that you think, if I could just walk through the door and get that, doesn't live up to all your expectations, does it? Right? Anybody ever, you got that gift you were waiting for, you got that trip you were saving up for, you got that relationship you were hoping for and praying for, you got that job or that promotion and all of a sudden you go, and it's just like, oh, there's another door I could walk through, right? You're just like, that one's over, great. This pasture's not as awesome as I thought. Let me walk through another door. Now, here's how we all know this. If you don't believe me, if you're like, oh, I don't know about Jesus. How many of you ever heard the phrase, the grass is always greener on the other side? Yeah. <clears throat> and how many of you know that that's like, a sarcastic saying. It's not actually meant to encourage you just to keep jumping the fence, going to another pasture, right? It's, it's meant to show us how foolish it is to chase these things, right? So even from a human level, we all know that all those other doors, all those other pastures we barge into don't do what? Fulfill us the way we are hoping. Give us the life we were wanting and desiring and needing. And then what do we do? We stand and they go, oh, the pasture over there looks way greener. I'm gonna go through that door. All the while, Jesus is over here going, I'm the door <laughs> that leads you to life. I'm the door that the sheep enter into and never need or want anything because I'm the good shepherd that sustains them and takes care of them. We're over here like, well, look at this one. Isn't this cool? Right? And you get it. And you're like, yes, God loves me because I got this thing. And then how many of you ever been content for like a millisecond and then wanted the next thing? Show of hands. Let's just all be honest in church today, right? Anybody ever had a dream, a hope, a desire, and you got it, and you were like, cool, God took care of me. I feel like this is the Lord loving me. And then you just said, I need nothing else for the rest of my life. I am good now, Lord. Has anybody reached that yet? I know Paul did in the Bible. He's fancy and Paul and everything, right? 
I know I haven't. Or you're like, I'll just get this next thing and life will be good. How many of you have gotten it? And then sooner or later, you're wanting to knock down another door and go into another pasture and say, but I need us just a little bit more. So what Jesus is teaching you and me is that, yeah, he's the door, and all the other ones are just deceptions. They're not going to fulfill us. What you and I know from human experience is that we're not ever quite fulfilled with all those other pastures. There's this beautiful passage in the book of Hosea that we had read as our Old Testament reading. And the book of Hosea is all about God's love for his people and God's people love for everything else but God. That's what it's a story of. It's a God pursuing out of endless mercy and love his sinful people the whole time his people are going, I love this idol, I love this God, I love this pasture more than the Lord. And yet the whole story is God continually trying to win his people's hearts back, trying to allure and woo you and me back to being in love with him more than anything else. And in chapter two, verse 15, God says this, And there I will give her her vineyards and make the valley of Acre a door of hope. So the valley of Acre was a place where a lot of destruction and wars had happened. And so it became an image for trouble or strife for the people of God. And God is saying out of his love and his grace and his mercy for you and me as his people, even though we declare our love for everything but him, even though we go after other doors and gates and pastures, he's saying, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna meet you in your trouble, in your strife, in your struggles in life, which we bring about ourselves, right? Anybody ever wondered why your pasture doesn't look so great? (laughs) You're like, who am I gonna blame for this? And you're like, oh, right, me, I'm the one, right? And he's saying, I'm gonna meet you there. And then rather than saying, I'm gonna leave you in that mess until you learn your lesson, right? Instead of saying, well, you got yourself here, you built your own door, it's your own dumb fault. What does he say? He says, I'm gonna turn that valley of acre, that pasture, that valley of struggle and strife and troubles into a door of And then the rest of the passage that was read is essentially explaining what happens when we walk through that door of hope. And the answer is that we get God and we get a perfect relationship with him. And he gives us all these promises. I am going to be your God and you're going to be my people and we're gonna be together forever and I'm never gonna abandon you or leave you or forsake you and I'm gonna give you everything that you need in this life and in the next. And then Jesus comes along and says, oh, that's a really good idea. Guess who that door of hope is? It's him. He's saying, I'm the door that's going to give you hope and life and a pasture that never disappoints you. And then he gives us this promise. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. He's trying to wake you and I up to enter through his door rather than any other one. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Now, I love this word abundantly. It's used a few times, three times in the New Testament, um, once by Jesus and then twice by Paul. And it always has to do in context with Jesus giving us life. And when Paul's talking about, he's talking about God's mercy and God's grace for us. And the way Paul uses it in Romans is he's comparing, kind of like Jesus is like, look, you can go through some doors, but they're gonna lead to what? Death and destruction. They're gonna lead, they're gonna be like the Valley of Acre, right? They're going to be trouble and struggles and strife, right? Anybody ever sat there kind of have a pity party where like, I've kind of made a mess of things, right? And you're like, this, is, this pasture's a disaster, right? And then Jesus says, but here's what I've come to do for you. 
Not, not to leave you in that, but to give you an abundant life. And the way Paul uses this word in Romans is he says, you and I have sin in our lives. How many of you would agree with that? I'm not perfect. My pasture is disgusting, <laughs> right? It's a horrid mess that I've made. Paul says, wherever sin abounds, grace abounds all the more, is the way it's usually commonly translated in English. And that's a wonderful promise, right? He says, no matter how um, disastrous our valley and pasture of acre looks, God is saying, I have a door of hope, a door of abundant life for you. Paul's saying, no matter how much sin is in our lives, no matter how many times we choose to walk through a different door rather than following Jesus in our lives, grace abounds all the more. Now, here's the image that this word literally means. Anybody ever cooked something on a stovetop and forgotten about it? Some of you are like, no, because I'm a good cook. Well, I have, right? <laughs> Usually, it's my wife is like, Honey, I've put this on. When it starts boiling, let me know. I'm like, got it. And then like every good husband, oh, I think I forgot something, right? <laughs> it's just, and she's like, how long has it been boiling? You know, I don't know. I'm bad with numbers. I don't know how long. It's been too long, right? Now, here's what happens if you do this, if you've ever been dumb like me, been a dumb sheep. When things are boiling, eventually what happens in your pot if you leave it going for too long? It overflows, right? It boils over and overwhelms you. That's the word that Jesus is using here. That's the word that Paul uses when he describes God's grace in our lives. He's saying it's like a pot on a stovetop that boils over to overflowing, right? It overwhelms you. There's too much of it. There's more than you need. And so Jesus says, I'm the door that's gonna give you life. He's saying, here's the kind of life I'm gonna give you. It's like a pot boiling over, and it's going to overwhelm you. It's going to be more than you could ever hope for or ever need. When you and I are stumbling around in the valley of Acre and in our own sins, the way Paul describes it says, here's God's grace for you. It's not just a one-to-one -one ratio, right? It's not just, I sinned once, God forgives me once. Paul's saying, no, 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 God's grace is like a pot boiling over on your stove, giving you way more than you could ever need, overwhelming you with his grace and mercy. And so Jesus is inviting you and me to walk through that door and say, I'm going to repent and confess my sin. I'm gonna rejoice in the grace that God gives to me. And rather than chasing every other idol, walking through every other door, building my own doors, thinking this one will be better, trying to make my own pasture, he's saying, I'm inviting you to leave behind the Valley of Acre. Leave, inviting you to leave behind your pasture of trouble and strife and mistakes and guilt and shame and sin. And I'm inviting you to follow me into the pasture that gives you life and life abundantly. And that's who your Jesus is. You get to be his dumb sheep. Congratulations. But the good news is Jesus really loves dumb sheep. He really loves foolish people who make mistakes and wrong choices, who knock on the wrong door and go into the wrong pasture. He says, no, I still love you. I'm going to give you abundant grace so that you can enter through this door and receive abundant life with him. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we give thanks for your grace and mercy. We give thanks for your invitation that we can leave behind the valley of acre, the pasture of trouble and sin and struggle, and instead enter through your door of hope that leads us to eternal life and leads us to an abundant life with you. May we always remember and trust in your Promise to us to give us grace abundantly so that we may rejoice and enjoy the life that you've given to us. In your name we pray, amen.